Um, thank you very much for coming this evening on a very wet day, uh, for a wet month. Um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, this is a very emotive and personal and important topic for so many residents and families, uh, businesses and charities and churches. So um, it's great to see everyone here to come together to discuss, uh, share thoughts and to hear why we're here. Um, we'd firstly like to acknowledge um, all the people who have got this project up to where we are now. There's been so many years of people fighting um, for, for, for change down in the pet level area to, to stop the flooding. So we'd just like to thank all those people who have created, obviously, organizations and groups and have got the EA and other sort of uh, organizations rolling on this topic. We are now in a stage where things are rolling. Um, persistence and determination are incredible values. It's about getting life done, which I think uh, echoes what the Future Landscapes Trust is all about. So who are we? Um, my name's Ollie. Uh, I was a chef. Uh, I had a, a pub and won awards for sustainability, most sustainable business, best organic uh, business. Um, I wrote two cookbooks off the back of that, became a food sustainability consultant, uh, won more awards for sustainability and um, continued my consultancy uh, as well as setting up various businesses, but I am at heart an environmental activist as well um, with a passion for uh, nature, nature-based solutions. Uh, Peter Smith, um, he uh, is currently the manager at the RSPCA Maladams. Uh, founder and chief executive of Wildwood Trust for 18 years and has been a leading proponent of rewilding for the last 30 years. Worked across the world as ecological consultant on some of the most groundbreaking habitat restoration projects. Uh, Craig Sams, co-founder of Whole Earth Foods, Green and Blacks, Carbon Gold, Biochar, uh, Gusto Organics, uh, director of Duchy Originals, an ex-chair of Soil Association and currently director of the Soil Association. Karen Burgess, who uh, is a therapist manager and lecturer in systemic psychotherapist for over 20 years in social care and the NHS. Her work promotes the idea that our mental health is improved by good relationships and community connection. In a, on a personal level, this has led her to being an advocate for improving mental health through nature and growing. She is a host for Woofing, which is, um, it's not rude, but it's the worldwide organization of organic farming, um, educating and supporting volunteers. Uh, and then Tim Jury, uh, who some of you, most of you probably will know, has for, um, farmed this catchment area all his life, as well as the Panel Valley, and has been practicing regenerative farming, um, having questioned the direction of conventional farming, which puts an emphasis, and regenerative farming puts an emphasis on life and the biology of the soil, creating a less stressful food production as well as mitigating environmental issues like flooding. So that's who we are. Um, we are a collection of landowners and managers, um, some of us long-term, some of us most recent. I've only um, had our parcel land for a year. Um, we are um, a nature-based solutions charity. We are now a registered charity. Uh, so we are governed by the Charity Commission. We are upheld by their laws and regulations. Um, we are looking at observing, monitoring, implementing, changing our landscapes for the future. Uh, we have five core values. The, to increase biodiversity, to sequester carbon, to mitigate floods, to create regenerative food production, and to add social value and education. Uh, the timeline of, organization, of our organization has been very quick, which is probably why you've never seen me or any of us before, because we weren't here last year at the other open meeting. Um, we pretty much got together um, last October uh, decided that we wanted to create a nature reserve concept through the valley and to start helping and uh, increasing those of the core values I've just mentioned. Um, and uh, one of the early meetings we had, we wanted to put ourselves forward for the EA's natural flood uh, management scheme, um, 
We put our bid in. Peter, who's been doing this for many, many years and is an expert in this field, obviously made a very uh, successful application. We've won our bid and we're now here, which is why you're all here to see us as well. Um, so that's who we are. We have, as I said, formed a charity. Um, we have started work with consultants, ecologists, professionals, uh, we, which you'll see in a minute on our presentation. We actually do have uh, a, um, a consultant on board who has given us a flood and rainfall analysis report, which has been incredibly high, uh, interesting and highlighting to the issues. Um, we don't just assume that uh, the narrative story or um, our thoughts are true. We are going to be guided by scientific evidence, uh, proof, and um, implementing proof of product on our own lands with the ambitions to then help other people facilitate change on their own lands. Managing land is very difficult. It's very time consuming. It's very money consuming. We recognize that in its entirety. And as a result, we would love to see our charity be a, um, a, a process by which other landowners and managers can receive money in exchange for facilitating the, the right natural-based solution on their land to help both mitigate floods, increase biodiversity, sequester carbon, um, food production, or social value. Um, and in that sense that we are, we are um, doing it for the better good. Um, I would also just like to acknowledge uh, tonight as well, before we go into the presentation, uh, climate change and the ongoing changes to our weather systems. Uh, we are in changing times, uh, with most of these new effects here to stay, or at least semi-permanent. We have uh, to fight nature with nature, and I'm sure everyone has heard of the floods uh, earlier this year in Dubai or Rio de Janeiro, um, Dubai being one of them uh, probably most um, human-created places on Earth, uh, and also one of the highest GDP per capita on Earth, and yet the flood still stopped a city uh, for working and caused devastation. So we are looking to create nature-based solutions. Um, in acknowledging this change, um, we also want to value everyone's experience and history and past on this land, um, the thoughts on the valley and water management. Um, but we must also accept that uh, the way rain is falling, the way water is moving through the valley has changed, and that we must reflect that as well. Um, we will, one of the most interesting points from the presentation, uh, which we'll get onto, is that over the last 30 years, rainfall levels uh, have been reducing annually, year on year. But it's the increase of how quickly it falls in the shortest amount of space of time. And that's where nature-based solutions can make a difference. Um, so what we're trying to do is mitigate flash flood events. But also, that also means we need to store water on the land for when we need it in the summer. Our summers are getting drier, our winters are getting wetter. So we, what we need to do is to manage water in a slightly more different way to what we might have been doing over the years. Um, Storing water on the land in the right time and the right processes allows the water to soak back into the aquifers and back into the valley for our foods to be grown, for the animals to be kept well, um, for the trees to grow and to create a good nature. Um, I'm going to pass you over to Peter. Peter is going to lead the presentation and um, I hope you find it interesting. I hope you see that we've created some interesting studies already and that this is just the start of us. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Well, thanks for coming. I hope I'm not going to bore you too much, right? But I'm going to go through. There's some stuff that we're supposed to tell you because that's what the Environment Agency wants us to um, say. But I'm going to try and show you the work we've done um, to look at how water's falling in the valley and what we plan to do and the research we're going to do before we do actually do anything. So, um, what is natural flood management? Well, it's what Ollie's already described. It's using nature to solve that problem. This NFM program came about because many of the brightest minds of the government, an oxymoron, I know, but came to realize that spend, they couldn't afford to spend more and more money on pouring concrete 
and dealing with the increasing problems of flooding. And we're seeing that across the region in Hastings and others. Uh, flooding is becoming a much more serious problem. But by understanding often what our forefathers knew about water catchments, we can actually make some changes to land and then we can reduce flood. And we'll see what we're doing. So one of the structures we might use is called a beacon. And this is one of the structures that will help stop flooding by holding water back and then releasing it slowly. So there's many processes. The biggest thing you can do to reduce flooding is actually change the habitat, the old habitats, the wooded heath, the bogger moors, the peaty soils. That's really <coughs> what reduces the speed of water flowing over land. And land that's no good for agriculture needs to return to that. And that thick vegetation traps the water, it takes energy on, on steep slopes, and that slows the flow, as they call it. But it does more. As you limit those natural functions, you actually suck carbon back into the soil. You, you can actually clean the water. So the water starts taking out um, some of the sediments that cause clogging. It can reduce any pollutants in the water. So when we look, what does it look like in the valley? Well, it looks something like this. In the upland areas, <coughs> at the top, you want your pretty soils, right? Soils that can hold water. And if you stand on a peat bog, you might think that you're standing at the same level. But there's peat bogs I stood on where between winter and summer, you're actually four foot higher or lower. And that's how much water can be stored under your feet in a peat bog. So those peaty, heathy upland soils are really important to storing those rib winter rains. As you come down, you want woodland. You can also put in what we call the leaky dams here. Yeah? How you farm some of your fields, cross plowing, going with the contours, you can make little uh, offline storage ponds, and then you can also look at how the channel is. We're not doing that in the Martian Valley, but purely concentrating on the upland storage. And I'll show you some maps later on. So these are all the benefits. We can make a resilient ecosystem. <coughs> we can help little butterflies and birds, little creatures. We can bring back water bottles to the valley if we do it right. And um, certainly some valley dams where they used to live. We can draw people together working for a common purpose. We can create more habitats, improve that water quality, reduce erosion, and reduce flooding risks, and even help farmers by managing some sediments. The funding requirements we had to do was to deliver approved projects. I won't bore you with the details. We had to demonstrate that it really would reduce flooding. We had to make sure that we provided value for money. We had to align with the local flood risk management plans and strategies. We had to commit to the project monitoring we're doing and have plans to make sure it goes on in the future and doesn't fall apart. So what does this mean? The project aims to help the local community and really what we're trying to do is reduce the peak flow through the village. All right, I'll come to what that means later on. We need to hold the water in the valley sides during the peak rainfall. The first thing we're going to do, so the thing that me and Ollie, Karen and Bill are doing is we have to organize the base research, so some wildlife monitoring, and we've got to do more flood monitoring, which we're just about to get installed. Thankfully, Southern Water has agreed to pay for that. And that measures the water flow and the levels in all of the little streams that are coming through the valley. And then we'll gather that data. Then I've got to put all the business plan together with who's doing all the work, how much it's going to cost, and get that approved. But we've mostly this year we're taking measurements and scientific monitoring and starting putting together the people who've got the skills, foresters and land managers who can do the project. But we know what happened back last year. We've seen the flooding. And the other thing that Ollie has been doing, and I, is the scientific side, engaging an expert 
to model all this in a computer and tell us whether all our efforts will actually stop this happening. So, first of all, we've already analyzed three and four, lots of data. And we put that into a graph. And the strange thing is, you think we're getting more reading, but we're not. That's really odd, isn't it? We're not getting more reading. The rainfall for all the value has actually gone down since 1990. And it's, if you look at the statistics, it's actually statistically significant that it's going down. So we're actually getting less rainfall. So something else happened. And the two things that happen is the water's flowing faster off the land, or we're getting clustering effects of that rainfall. <coughs> so we need to model that so we know when the rain hits that the work we do, and as we start doing this work, we will be monitoring to see if it's having any effect. So science is going to tell us if it works or not. This here is what happens in the flood. So these blue blocks are your rainfall coming down. And it gathers on the valley side and it starts coming down. Now the green line is the height of the water which would be at pet level. And you can see that it gathers from all the valley sides and it hits at one time, and we call that the peak flow. And the peak flow is when it floods the village. And our job is just like with what they used to talk about COVID, we have to look at this peak flow, and then we have to do things to the valley side, that, because we can't reduce the amount of water coming through, still going to be the same amount of water, but what we can do is spread out the time that it hits. So we flatten the curve. That's the key to making this project work. <coughs> Flattening the curve of when the water hits. So we've already done some computer modeling. This is a computer model I made last year. And looking at the EA data, the environment agency, that of where the water comes down the valley and where we could possibly make changes. And this is what the landowners and our partners um, started talking about. What would, could we do to make that difference? We so far just commissioned um, some experts in this area to start modeling the data, to give us these predictions. And we've made a computer model, as can be seen here, of the entire catchment. The red line is where, that's where the raindrops flow towards pet level, and on the other side they flow away. And we can actually model how every raindrop hits each part, how the habitat either makes that raindrop go quickly or it goes slowly into all the different streams. We've looked at other sites where the rainfall is likely to happen, the steepness and the height. In this model, shows the steepness of the slopes, but it actually shows where that's showing you where the water will flow the fastest, the quickest. And that's the most dangerous thing that keeps that peak flow the highest. And if we can look at where this peak flow comes, now this white line here is the catchment, so we've got to work with it here. And it just so happens that along this line here, is the most dangerous part that causes the greatest amount of flood. And that just happens to be Mary Dan's work here. And Stony Linkwood here. And Hordeswood there. And that's what brought us together, is how can we actually manage those woodlands and the grasslands to capture that water and not make it part of the problem. Because a lot of the woodlands, they aren't the best for, um, a lot of them have become overgrown with rhododendron. They've lost some of those wooded heathwood habitats, the wet woodland habitats. And that's what we want to return. As an ecologist, I just want it to return because we get more wildlife, right? And have little night jars fly, <coughs> little water bodies sitting at the bottom of my woodland. But it just so happens doing the same thing will also maybe stop pet level from flooding. 
Here's another one where I model where the various flood structures, because we can change habitat, you know, the ground, make it more vegetation, make the soil have more carbon in it, so the water's more likely to penetrate deeper and held on. But we can also put in these leaky dams, these structures that create a series of pools that will add to the flow of fill and then slowly release. So that's all what we were trying to do. The boring bit is how we're going to do it. So this is what's been going on, and I've had lots of bits of paperwork and spreadsheets to fill in that we've been working behind the scenes to make this a reality. We're filling all the um, paperwork that's needed um, so far this year, and we're all coming along to getting the project to fully start September, October this year. Okay, so that's when the first leaky dams will start being built and hopefully, well, we've got to wait until the, the birds stop nesting, but towards the back end of summer, we'll start making the big habitat change. The first is ripping out all the rhododendron. That's the biggest thing. Because well, rhododendron looks awful. It makes the soil just really black. Nothing's in it. The water just <coughs> shoots straight over it. And preparing to sign the grant agreement, we've just done that. We've started a landowner engagement was done very early on with a fantastic bunch of enthusiastic landowners who wanted to be part of it. Remember, we're not getting a penny out of this. This is all the money spent through a charity, not a penny going to landowners. It's all going to be, every single penny has to be accounted for, both by the Environment Agency and by the Charity Commission. We need to engage you, the community. The people who know this valley far better than and I want to hear your views and work with you. I'm not here to impose solutions. We're here to try to do our best and work together. We need to set, we've started setting up the government's, government's arrangements, and then we haven't got a bank account yet. We're still waiting on bank account debt. Then we'll start getting the money in. Then we've got to get, we've already engaged the experts. We get detailed design, and we, we will take in people's views as we do that. And that has to be submitted, this whole business case has to be done by September, and then we start getting all the right permits and licenses, because some of it needs planning, and other consultation with the local council, and we get on and do it. Okie doke, and uh, if you have any problem with flooding, there's what to do for the flood line. Okay, and uh, we also, we don't know everything, so we've started bringing in people who do know these things. Um, the High Wheel National Landscape, South East Rivers Trust. We've got Southern Water Responses now, who we've given a generous donation of £30,000 and expert help. And we're hoping to be pulling in some more cash to help us as we go down. So, thank you for putting up with me, and we'll start to take your questions, which Craig will check. So, um, do we have any questions? 